we'll start next with uh, Richard Neutra, very, very important American modernist architect, as we will see. So Neutra is another European architect that comes to the United States and really brings uh, the ideas of European modernism and uh, mixes that with early American modernism and creates a distinctly early American modernist uh, movement here. So he was from Austria. He had trained and worked under Adolf, uh, uh, Adolf Luss, who we had talked about. Luss being uh, almost an extreme early European modernist where he considered ornament to be a crime, almost literally, and wanted his buildings stripped entirely of any extraneous frivolous ornamentation. He wanted the architecture to be beautiful in and of itself in the craft and in the structure and in the massing and forms and not artificially made beautiful by decorations applied to it. Uh, and so that, uh, as we'll see, really is influential to Neutra. He uh, came to the United States. He actually came again to Chicago. He worked for Hullabird and Roche, uh, one of the great Chicago school uh, firms that was building some of the high rises in Chicago at the time. Uh, and then he went out uh, to LA and worked and became really good friends. They were actually knew each other back when they were both still in Europe. Uh, and so when he got to America, he reached out to his friend Schindler and Schindler said, hey, don't stay in Chicago, the weather sucks. Uh, come on out to LA, it's beautiful. So he did and uh, they actually wound up living together in Schindler's house. Uh, uh, this is a photo of uh, Schindler on the right with his wife and child and Neutra on the left. And they were very close for a time, literally and, and figuratively. They were, they were very good friends and shared a lot of ideas together. Um, but then Neutra's career really took off. As we'll see, there was a, quite a snub that happens architecturally and the two began to sort of split in their relationship. But, uh, and Neutra becomes, you know, very famous both contemporary, contemporaneously uh, and is, you know, very, very well known in architectural history circles. And Schindler kind of began to fade into obscurity, unfortunately. And the reason for that split is because of this next project. Uh, this is the Lovell House designed by Richard Neutra. We just talked about the Lovell Beach House designed by Schindler. So when it came time for Dr. Lovell and his family to build a, a grander house for themselves, the Beach House was just a you know, little weekend getaway, they don't turn to Schindler, they turn to Neutra. And, you know, this is one of the great, I call architectural snubs, you know, that they shift from one architect to another. And this really makes Neutra's career. This is one of the most important works of your American modernism. And it's Neutra and not Schindler. I think it's the commission. So now we know about Neutra and not Schindler. Uh, so this is a historic view of it. It's a very dramatic setting up in the um, Hollywood Hills. Uh, with an incredible vista panorama of you know the the Holly, you know L.A. Valley and Hollywood down below, and um, uh, you know this is a full embrace of all the modernist principles uh, by 1929. So this is contemporary to the Barcelona Pavilion and the Tugendhat House and the Via Savoy, um, and is a complete break because. Neutra never really worked. He was influenced by Vosma portfolio and the sort of ideas that Wright had. But he, unlike Schindler, did not really embrace many of Wright's aesthetics. He really had come from the European modernist tradition and stuck with that. And we see that very, very clearly with the Lovell House, which looks like it could be right out of uh, Germany from the same time. What's incredibly innovative about this house, it is a steel frame house. Uh, this might not seem all that shocking, but this is a this is a house. This isn't a high rise in Chicago or New York, uh, you know, where steel frame was certainly, you know, common, <laughs> of course, by this by the 1920s, everything was steel frame like this. Uh, but this is this is just a single family house, and the whole thing is 
steel frame with you can even see the uh, the open joists and so forth. So uh, this if if the idea of modernist architecture is that you complete or you could create an independent structural system and the, the facade and the interior is completely independent of that. We see this very clearly ex expressed here with the Lovell House. In floor plan, it's a little complex because again, it sits on this hillside. So once again, at the uh, at the top here is the end level. You come into an entry pavilion and a, and a hall, and then you would descend the stairs down to the main living level, which is a low floor lower, but uh, still allows you this incredible vista. So it's a little bit of the reverse of the French Premier Etage, but that's because of the particular siting uh, that this house has. Same way with Tugendat House, you actually descend to the lower level, but that gives you this great panoramic vista uh, down the hillside. Same here at uh, level house. So there's an open living room and dining room like we had just seen and that also connects into an uh, open library area. There's not a single wall between the library, the living room, and the dining room. It is one open space. Uh, that is a radical concept you know in the 1920s. The kitchen is still a back of house area that you know the novels would have had to serve in for. On the upper floor are some uh, bedrooms and so forth that also many of them have great uh, vistas as well. The ground floor, there's a swimming pool and there's some, you know, support spaces for that. So a little bit of a walkthrough. Most of these are my photos. I've, I actually got a chance to go in the house last fall. Really exciting. Uh, so this is at the entry level. Uh, so you're walking off, you know, the driveway uh, into the, on the right is uh, sort of a, a courtyard area for the entry, which is nondescript. Uh, it's a rather restrained entry, much like we saw at uh, Via Savoy or Dugandat House as well. But you can see to the left, the, the vista really opens up. And I wouldn't call these pilotis per se, but this, you know, the columns on the left here are exposed open columns that are part of the structural system, much like uh, pilotis would represent. Off in the background, you can see the hilltop over here. That's the Griffith uh, Observatory, the famous site uh, in the LA uh, hills there. So this is a view uh, sort of from an intermediate level looking more at the face of the house. And again, you can see what we could kind of call pilotis over here on the left or on the right, it's really part of this exposed structural frame and it helps to show that the house walls and windows are completely independent. They are simply a curtain hung from this structural frame system. And we have a lot of glazing. This is going even beyond uh, Corbusier's idea of ribbon windows and a, and a horizontal band where we're, uh, we're seeing uh, almost a whole wall of glass uh, which is you know, very unusual for a residential structure even in this era. This is a view uh, in the living room looking towards the library. So we see the stair coming down on the right, very geometric forms in the genre of Corbusier. And there's a floor level change uh, between the living room and the, and the library off in the distance there. Uh, but for the most part, you know, there, there are definitely no walls, and there's just very subtle design differences that uh, connotate a, a change of use in space. Uh, but other, otherwise, this is a completely unified main, you know, main space all on one level here. A couple of views uh, left is the a view of a seating niche next to the stair, and you can see the huge wall of glass that as you're coming down or going up or down the stairs, you get this incredible vista of the valley beyond. Uh, and if you're sitting in this niche, you get uh, the light and the view and you open the window, you get this air. It's a great little reading spot. On the right view is of the chimney core. Uh, so there's a fireplace that sort of serves as the visual focus of the, of the main living room. 
And then this is a view, you see the chimney core there on the left and the main sort of living and dining areas off in the distance with a complete wall of windows, again, like we saw at say the Jugendat house. In this case, there's not full sheet, uh, uh, plate glass sheets. Uh, they're still somewhat more divided, but you can see how you can just open up all the windows in the house and let in lots of that wonderful LA air and ventilation. There's another view with one of Mises Barcelona chairs on display here. Fits in very nicely with that. And there you can really tell the great vista that the locals had. All right, so uh, another uh, important project by Neutra is his own home and studio from 1932. So this comes just a few years after the Lovell House and represents a kind of a continuing evolution that Neutra would have throughout his career. Uh, it's called the VDL Research House, uh, but it essentially is his home and studio. Uh, so he works from here and, and um, kind of considered it a research house because like many architects, uh, his own house was his time and place to experiment, you know. Paying clients might not always appreciate, you know, trying out new ideas on them. Uh, so you can you can try something out, and if it doesn't work, you know, you can change it later on your own or something like that. And if it does work, you can point to your clients and say, "Hey, look at this cool idea I put in my house. Let's do that in your your design too." And so he's got a lot of experimental aspects to it, far more than I can really talk about in this lecture today. But this is the front view of it. Um, I actually saw this house for the first time last fall and it kind of surprised me. I had no idea that it sits on a very busy street uh, and I'm, I'm the photographer here is almost standing uh, at, at the sidewalk at the street with cars racing by. Uh, this always looked like this quaint pastoral setting to me with the with the water and the garden and all that out front. And it's not like that at all. It has a nice view of the of Silver Lake uh, across the street, but it's a very busy street. So what we see here uh, is the main entrance right here in the center and you access it by a concrete walk that actually goes over top of this water garden in the bottom here. And on the right side are these vertical fins that are meant as sunscreens. And uh, this is an early use of modernist architects using architecture to uh, adapt to light and shadow and, and, and sort of limit the amount of sunlight that would pour into these <laughs> steel and glass buildings, which, you know, we would we would soon learn it is a bit of an issue. The other way he solves that is on the left with a very very deep overhang that will create a shadow uh, to to the essentially wall of windows in the bedroom of this second floor level that's up here uh, with a flat roof. So we see more of the Europeanist European modernist influence with more flat roofs. Uh, and in fact, we'll see a roof garden here I think in a moment. This is a historic view from almost the same vista, and we can see the louvers on the right, and uh, a little bit more now from this vista, you can see up towards the top is the trellis for the roof garden. So some of those same um, sort of five points of Corbusier show up a little bit here, not as, not as pronounced. We don't really see the pilotis in this case, but we see the ribbon walls, the free-floating partitions, or free-floating exterior walls. We'll see free-floating partitions in a moment. And of course, the roof garden. So here's the roof deck garden uh, with a, a picture of Neutra sitting up here. And if you notice carefully, uh, we'll see a few things architecturally. We see the, the huge plate glass windows. Uh, so now we're at a point where the whole wall can just be giant plate glass, plate glass windows. And we see the roof deck that is characteristic. But notice the, the water on the roof here. This was an experiment uh, in which uh, the roof would be designed to act as a bathtub. And when it would rain, rather than just completely being drained off, uh, the idea was that it would collect, uh, you know, maybe a couple of inches of water and hold that. And it was meant to be an insulator. Uh, water is a good insulator, and this would be a way of trying to insulate the roof. I actually lived in an apartment building from the 1950s when I lived in Springfield for a few years, and the roof was designed to be like that. And 
my roof leaked. <laughs> One day I woke up and the, it was dripping out and I called the landlord and he said, oh yeah, yeah, that's always been a problem in this building that, you know, that it was meant to be a bathtub and it never worked. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure this roof leaked too. I always say any great architect, you, you know, they're only great if their roofs leak. So here is a floor plan. Uh, the entry that uh, view that we were looking at is way over here on the left. So the sidewalk is at the very left of the image and the busy, busy street is right next to that in the black here. Uh, so here we see the uh, sort of concrete bridge that goes across the little water garden out front into this entry area. Here are the fins of the, uh, the vertical fins of the louvers. So you come into a, an entry area and we see a little bit of a courtyard house. There's an, this inner courtyard area here that the rooms really open up into, these huge window walls in the living room and even in this guest room. Uh, and then, you know, rooms that flow in and around. This is another courtyard space. You can really, in Southern California, you can really have a lot of connection of the interior and the exterior because you don't have to deal with nasty weather very often. A few views of the interior. I haven't gotten inside the house yet. Uh, that'll be on my next trip out here. But uh, the, you really get a sense of the openness that can occur in the full-fledged modernism uh, with, with just an independent structure, and then you, you don't really even need walls on the inside, or you can just have these glass partitions. The floating stair where you just have stringers and threads, and you don't have to have the vertical risers. It's not solid anymore. This is an early characteristic of a modernist staircase. A couple other views uh, uh, of the, the inside outside connection of glass walls and courtyards and so forth that carry on throughout the house and a view of his study and office suite here uh, with uh, we saw this from the exterior view the the deep overhanging eave is there on the left and a just complete wall of windows which is possible because you have an independent structural system and this is, makes for great vistas and light and so forth. And all we needed was air conditioning in order to really make this work. And the last house I want to talk about from Neutra is uh, one of his most famous, and that is the Kaufman House in Palm Springs from 1947. This is a very famous, this is a historic photo by a very famous photographer, Julia Schulman. Uh, showing somebody lounging there by the pool, and we see the mountains in the background and so forth. And got a more contemporary view here. Uh, this house has been beautifully restored. And you know, Palm Springs was the getaway for the rich and famous of, of LA. So there were lots of wealthy clients, uh, Hollywood stars, and and so forth that uh, would commission architects in the 30s, 40s, and 50s uh, to design houses out here. And, and this is one of the uh, greats and one of the early ones uh, by Neutra. He did several others in Palm Springs, but the Kaufman was his uh, greatest work. So we see um, the, the uh, really full emergence of modernism here with the uh, walls of glass, the flat roofs, the steel frame fully expressed, some other views. Here's a historic view of the the wall of windows, big plate glass windows. And just like we saw, say, at Villa Savoy, where you could slide open the panel of glass and just walk right outside to your pool deck. Uh, some of the people that live out here are, you know, Sinatra, and Dean Martin, and Bob Hope, Sammy Davis Jr. Um, I, I usually joke that Barry Manilow owned this house. And most of you probably have no clue who Barry Manilow is, but really, sappy singer from the 1970s. Uh, in plan, though, we see still some remnants of Frank Lloyd Wright and his pinwheel pattern of, of planning. And in fact, at the very core of the pinwheel is the fireplace mass right here. And the dining room and, and they call it lounge room, but essentially living room, all spin around this. And then the wings stretch out like the pinwheel into different, you know, you got the carport, you got a boiler house, but you know, one is a master bedroom, a guest suite, and so forth. And so, 
this pinwheel pattern emerges uh, here in the 1940s is still that influence from Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie style houses from you know essentially 50 years earlier. Here's another great view. This is the master bedroom. Um, you know, if you're rich and famous, you can uh, have this kind of vista and you can have a wall of glass that just opens up and you can walk right from your bed out to the pool in the morning. So uh, one of the, the things that really spurs uh, modernism in the United States is the Museum of Modern Art, uh, or MoMA, and this international architecture ex exhibition that happens in 1932. Uh, the curators were Philip Johnston and Henry Russell Hitchcock. Hitchcock was a, a, an academic architectural scholar uh, and, um, you know, wrote about architecture and, you know, had a very good understanding of that. Johnson was a design enthusiast turned architect. We're going to talk about Johnson later uh, as modernism continues. He was really inspired by the designs of the modernist movement, and it encouraged him to become an architect himself. But at this time, he's not really an architect yet. Uh, he's more of a scholar and a, a design enthusiast, and he helps put this together, the show together, and then later would be a leader in, in American modern architecture. So these are some historic views of the exhibition, and right front and center in this gallery is a model of Via Savoy. So Cabousier is, is heavily on display here. We see a couple of photos of Via Savoy there uh, on the wall to the left, just as we had seen in our earlier lecture. These are pages from the exhibition catalog uh, and projects we talked about. Millard House in Pasadena, the textile block house on the left. The Bauhaus, uh, Gropius on the right. Via Savoy again there on the left. Barcelona Pavilion on the right. So if you thought I was just making up and you know, you know, just creating, you know, showing you these buildings out of the blue, and that they they were all really important works of architecture at the time. There were many others on exhibit during the show as well, but um, just. You know, these were these were in many cases some of the first opportunities for Americans to really see these buildings in more detail. They might have seen in a publication of here and there some of these uh, published published, but you know, even like Villa Savoy and uh, Barcelona Pavilion, they were only a few years old when this was uh, this exhibition happened. So this was still very new, very modern uh, to uh, to those who saw the exhibition or got the catalog. The, uh, there's the Lovell House on the right. So Neutro was featured as well. Uh, and again, a view of the Hollywood Hills before any other houses by rich and famous people uh, populated them. Uh, on the left is one we didn't talk about, uh, but is one of the earliest uh, international style high rises in, in the world uh, by Howe and Lascaz. Um, uh, in Philadelphia, the uh, savings bank. This is from 1931-32, uh, which looks like it could be right out of the 1950s. So this is about uh, 20 years ahead of its time. We probably would have seen more modernist high-rises like this if it weren't for the Great Depression, which had all but stopped building construction in the 1930s. And of course, World War II doesn't allow for you know much new construction either. So you know we'll we'll see a pickup after this lecture. We'll pick up essentially in the 1950s after the end of World War II and the Great Depression. 